This is the Star Wars Bad Batch podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Star Wars The Bad Batch, Episode 9, Bounty Lost. How's my asset doing? My name is Omega. Who are you? Cad Bane, at your service. You'll be sorry when my friends come for me. Your friends are long gone. I made sure of that. No one is coming for you, little lady. Now sit tight and don't cause any trouble. But when will you have time to fix my leg? It is quite inconvenient. Bane. Welcome back, fellow troopers, to our discussion about Star Wars The Bad Batch. We're talking about Episode 9, Bounty Lost. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow troopers. I'm one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out this lost group of Batchers, uh, I am Chris. Actually, it would have been better if I said this lost group of bounties, but then I straight away went, mm, mm. I really want a bounties chocolate uh, bar now. <laughs> milk, milk chocolate bounty. Yeah. Do you know, I was saying I was saying to John, my brain was going really weirdly on the name of the episode because it's called Bounty Lost, and I was thinking, ooh, chocolate bar, bounty. And that's always done in like a desert island setting. And yep. I was like, oh, do they mean Paradise Lost? Is it something like that? And then I went, nope, reading way too much into the title of this episode. It's just about <laughs> the bounty that was lost. That's yes. all. Uh, we hope you've watched the episode. If you haven't watched the episode, episode for uh this this week for star wars about batch it's a really good episode and uh, don't want to spoil it before you've watched it so go off and watch it and come back and join us for our spoiler filled discussion as we do every week um for star wars about batch and also for marvel's loki uh, which we're uh, podcasting about every every thursday night uh so two podcasts at the moment every week from tv podcast industries if you're not subscribed to the main feed you can subscribe to that on tv podcast industries.com where you get all of our podcasts I think we're pretty close to 600 episodes now at this stage. Oh I think God. we are at 589 episodes at my last count. Wow. You may say, is that too much content? You could be right, but we don't think so. We think it's a just enough. It's amazing, right? I mean, yeah, it's I, gold I don't, I don't content. think it's too much. There are there are terrible podcasts out there that have got way more than six hundred episodes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're we're about the right level for yeah. uh, for our wonderful fellow defenders and fellow uh, troopers. Um, and not everybody listens to every single episode because you have to be watching the show as well. So I totally get that. It is true, but if you want to support our little old podcast and just the right amount of podcasts you can head on over to patreon.com slash tv podcast industries where for just a single a galactic credit you too can support us but if you don't want to do a recurring payment no problem we understand that the empire is slowly changing all your credits to the intergalactic galactic credit so you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash tvpi where you can buy our illustrious editor, Derek, right here, you can buy him a coffee. It's not Star Wars themed coffee, unfortunately, because I'm assuming that would be like with a K and an E and a weird squiggle. <laughs> but like, I'm pretty sure there probably is a coffee version in the Star Wars universe. I'm sure there is. There must be. Yeah. yeah. I actually, you probably have to Google that. I'm sure there's a version of coffee that's been in uh, one of the TV shows. In fact, I think there was one in Mandalorian. Um, the other benefit to that, to buying me a coffee, is that John lives with me, so he also gets coffee. And Chris occasionally visits, so he also gets coffee. Yes, it's true. You can buy us coffee. It's <laughs> great. Go. It's there a great service. But we're not here to talk about coffee. We are here. Well, we could. We could talk about Star Wars. It'd be like Kopi or something now. But anyway, we're not here to talk about Star Wars Kopi, which is also known as coffee. We're here to talk about the Bad Batch. Yes, we are. Uh, this episode was executive produced once again, Dave Filoni and Jennifer Corbett. This episode was written by Matt Miklovitz, uh, story editor for the season. He's been the story editor in every episode so far. Uh, and the episode was directed by Barrett Brow and Nathaniel Villanova, who both directed earlier episodes of this season. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis of The Bad Batch Episode 9, Bounty Lost? Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop. <laughs> I might have to get you a sound effect for that in the future. That means sure <laughs> sure, droid, sure in droid, exactly. <laughs> I've been studying it closely, <laughs> young Padawan. Um, anyway, closely pursued by Crosser, the Bad Batch manage to make their escape from Bracca and try to pick up the trail of bounty hunter Cad Bane. He has imprisoned Amiga aboard his ship, the Xanadu Blood, and left his damaged droid Toto 360 to guard their bounty. 
Toto needs fixing, but Bane has more pressing matters to deal with as he calls in his successful capture of Amiga to Kerminoan Prime Minister Lama Su and arranges the prisoner transfer. After rejecting an offer from Nala Se to go to the rendezvous because of her personal interest in Amiga, Lama Su sends another Kamino and Toan Wei to their abandoned facility on Bora Vio to retrieve Amiga. Meanwhile, aboard the Xanadu Blood, Amiga tricks Toto 360 into freeing her from her prison and retrieves her comm device to reach out to the Bad Batch for rescue. She escapes from the ship and tries to hide on Bora Vio, but Cad Bane soon recaptures her and brings her to meet Ton Wei. But when he arrives, Bane finds the Kaminoan has been shot by Fennec Shand. <sighs> As Fennec attempts to trade for Amiga, a battle breaks out between the bounty hunters, and Amiga runs free. Shand has been sent to the planet by Nala Se to protect the clone. In the confusion of the fight between Shand and Bane, Amiga gets aboard an escape pod and is recovered by the Bad Batch aboard the Havoc Marauder. Fennec is told not to follow them, and with Cad Bane's ship sabotaged, the clones escape the system. But the team have learned why Amiga is so important, and Hunter shares with her that she is the only source of pure genetic material from the original template Django Fett. The Kevin Owens won't give up their pursuit, but Hunter pledges that the Bad Batch will always keep her safe. A promise from the Bad Batch to Amiga. Uh, I guess we'll find out as the series goes on whether they'll be able to keep that promise uh, as well. So uh, I really loved this episode. Uh, I thought this was a really, really good follow-up to our mid-season point last week. What did you think overall, guys? Uh, John? Yeah, no, I I really enjoyed this. I love the fact that it does follow on immediately. You know, just Mm -hmm. get that short little um, fighter chase uh, f- uh, between the Havoc Marauder and the ship that Crosshair is on. Mm-hmm. And I, again, just because of that, you know, that connection really makes us feel, um, just more so that, that two story arc, that companion piece, uh, with the other episode. Yeah. And so the two of them, uh, together, you know, even though we're discussing this separately, you know, you, you see that whole sort of, um, single arc yeah. and episode really nicely. So, um, yeah, I, I really like this. Absolutely. What about you, Chris, in general? I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. This gave me almost movie, uh, aesthetic level vibes. Mm-hmm. I think just the, 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 the pacing, the action. This was what I very much thought this show was going to be mm-hmm. versus, uh, the, the initial, and you guys have, again, you've signposted this for me, yeah. which is, uh, the initial, monster exploit of the week takes and then these larger more set piece episodes kind of take place then and this see this felt more like that set piece where it was just a, a prolonged story piece from end to end that was just beautifully written and gave me enough information i could have seen this episode and the original number eight back to back like if they if they had have done you like mm-hmm. If they had, I'm not saying they, they should have, but like if they had have kind of condensed those two into a one hour episode and is that kind of like, oh my yeah. God, like a special mid season, like one hour extravaganza. Because I, thinking back, like that extent, the, the extended piece there is just fantastic because it's the, the loss and then the re, the regaining of Omega. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I was just saying to John that I I did have uh, I did see a note from Eric Goldman who used to work for IGN now works for Get Fandom saying that he wishes that the season had ended with episode eight and we waited for uh, if this episode nine would be the premiere of season yeah. two and I was going no I wouldn't want to wait that long with Omega captured by Cad Bane at the end of last episode and waiting six months to to another season coming you know um so yeah I guess it's I guess it's quite a long season with 16 episodes but they're only 22 minutes long and uh, it's nice to have Star Wars throughout the summer but speaking of set pieces uh slightly hidden within the uh synopsis which was I think pretty detailed of, of the overall events that were going on slightly hidden within that was um, our bl- blaster point number one, which was effectively a battle here between two bounty hunters, between yeah. Cad Bane and Fennec Shand, um, which is our main kind of blaster point because it did take up a significant proportion of the episode. And it was great to see these two up against each other. Um, Cad Bane being, as we said before, kind of the Wolverine in this universe, the best at what he does. He's the best bounty hunter out there. And 
Fennec Shan being brand new to the game, but also really good, as we've seen uh, already in the show. She's pretty formidable as a bounty hunter. So seeing these two kind of the the older state elder statesmen of bounty hunters versus the brand new upstart is kind of an interesting dynamic between the two of them. Yes, very much so. For um, I know you guys gave me a kind of breakdown, a rundown of him in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of and yeah, we saw we saw literally a sprinkling of what he was capable of in that mm-hmm. he took down Hunter. Um, yeah, like it, 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 we saw uh, the, the bear's tip of it. Yeah. Um, but for me, this this was a huge. Uh, yeah, it was the, the this is the introduction I wanted. So I have a question. The his outfit he has a kind of this I don't know this headpiece on him uh, that essentially kind of has two big tubes. Does he have gills that he's breathing through there, or what is that? Because it like the rest of it I get, and I've seen other. I'm pretty sure I've seen other of his species. No. I don't think we've seen many more of him, Chris. I think we've just seen him as a the species as a Duras. Um, and as I kind of mentioned last episode, he kind of came out of nowhere with no backstory and is just this literal badass for season, episode after episode of, of Clone Wars. So we don't know a huge amount of his background, but there's certainly something in his speech pattern that does sound a little bit like, uh, like he possibly has gills. There's a little bit of a, uh, a, a thing that sounds a little bit like Admiral Akbar, maybe that, yeah. that kind of species so potentially that they that could be uh something but i do love the design um, <laughs> that's all I, yeah. I well i will say for sure i love the design of Cat yeah the the design's fab mm-hmm. um but i have no idea whether say if he actually existed whether that would be um yeah, essential. But I guess so. You never know. Mandalorian, Mandalorian sees because it's not over his or mouth or his yeah. nose, unless his nose is kind of on his chin. Really cool. Okay, well, I just I love the overall aesthetic, and as you kind of his hat gets knocked off, I was just like, oh, what is like? Is she gonna like rip his like essentially his breathing apparatus off? Because I remember there was a film. Quite a kind of, I forget which sci fi film it was, but essentially, a, 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 there was a big battle and the, the guy's mask gets taken off and he can't breathe and he jokes that he dies. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, not going to happen in this film, but you understand where he's like, maybe she can de- de- uh, incapacitate him by getting rid of his breathing apparatus, but yeah. it was fantastic. It was a really good fight, and as I say, they're, they're quite, it's quite interesting to see, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be equals. But there's some really good moments where she's using everything to her advantage and he's using everything to his advantage to fight on the same level, I think. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt Cad Bane was almost like a Swiss army knife because, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he's got, he's kind of is, is, is falls off the side of this abandoned Kiminoan facility and he's got his blasters. So it's like all eventualities covered. Really, really, uh, liked, um, just the whole fighting and, and, Again, the the whole misty clouds on this facility, because oh, yeah. uh, a bit like Cloud City from um, Empire Strikes Back, yeah. but it ha- just because it's run down and that this was kind of seeping through into the corridors, it gave it a really uh, fantastic atmosphere. And mm-hmm. um, you know him coming out of the mist towards uh, Amiga whilst um, she was on the run from him, but then just helping with that sort of. Um, cat and mouse a bit between Bane and, and Shand. Um, but yeah, she, she was really, really good. You know, she held her own against, uh, Bane and, and to be honest, probably got the upper hand in the end. I mean, she, the, the, I love the little explosive, um, device to, to sort of take him out. Um, and ultimately sabotaging the ship as well. Uh, the use of the kind of the, 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 the bolos, beads. Yeah. The bolos that, mm-hmm sort of restrict him um like she was certainly uh you know new kid on the block with new tricks i think um yep. and so i really really kind of like that sort of difference just that she was one step ahead effectively because of who has hired her and mm-hmm. i guess that's the other interesting thing here is that this it, it felt like to me as well a bit that this fight between fennec shand and, and cad bane was also 
whilst we're not seeing it, there is a fight between Nala Se, who's hired Fennec and Lamassu, um, who's hired Cad Bane mm-hmm. from, with the K- Kim and Owens. Um, and I, I kind of really like that idea because, you know, the Kim and Owens from the, um, the, the, uh, prequels, you know, kind of uh, just very floaty yeah. and, um, very, you know, very floaty kind of, Look like they do way too much yoga, I guess, <laughs> um, and 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 relax a bit too much. But I, I like this th- this idea of sharing sort of a bit of the the rough and tumble of Kim and Owen politics just yeah. through these two, and just through the brief moment that we see of them, uh, where Lama Su um, sort of calls out uh, Nala Say's personal interest in Omega. So I mm. I, I guess he knows. Certainly that she was the one that effectively allowed her to escape with the Bad Batch initially, whether he knows that actually she's hired a bounty hunter to mm-hmm. rescue her. It also kind of makes the point that as a bounty hunter, Fennec Shand, in a sense, she's neither good or bad. She just deals in the commodity, exactly. and that may be good or bad. Um, in this case... It's yeah, it's all about the job yeah. to effectively keep um Omega safe in this case. And you know, I thought that's an interesting point that she doesn't uh keep um her her ticket open with Fennec Shand when she knows that the Bad Batch have have um managed to to rescue her yeah. and take her off planet. She's happy with the Bad Batch uh keeping them. Yeah. Uh so um then she you know, keeping her safe as well. Yeah. So I, I like I like that whole thing from from this for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like something really important to the new Star Wars universe, I guess we'll call it, these TV shows like Mandalorian yeah. and uh, and like The Bad Batch now, where they're dealing with bounty hunters because bounty hunters that have been seen in the past, the way they were introduced was that they were chasing down our hero, Han Solo. You know, that that's the, the moment you get introduced to the bounty hunters. So you think of them as bad guys. And what they've really been clear at doing in Mandalorian, so that you can root for your main character, is going, he follows the job, he gets paid money, he takes the, he takes the money and he goes out and does whatever job is required of him. And sometimes that's capturing somebody that, uh, that doesn't, that hasn't paid their rent effectively. And sometimes that's going out and getting, uh, getting a, a bad guy and taking them out and killing them effectively. But that's the job. That's what they're members of the bounty hunter guild for. It doesn't necessarily mean that they as bounty hunters are good or bad. So, um, so it kind of adds that grayness and adds that, uh, that, good element to them for being central characters. So we see here from Fennec Shand, we were kind of questioning whether she would turn and be, and go on the side of the Bad Batch and help to save Omega at some point during the series. And I love that they've allowed her to do that, but it's actually just because she's been paid money to do that. Yeah. So she's going to carry out the job. I think it's a good way, a good use of the character rather than her having, having a change of heart or being the bounty hunter with a heart of gold. She's just following the money basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also Toto 360 also, um, gets in on the action here <laughs> trying to, you know, at least support his boss. Um, like he, in the end, the unmarked credits get lost by him after mm. he, um, t- sort of, wrestles it out of Fennec Shan's hand. He's, you know, he tries to recapture Omega for him after, you know, he's been kind of flung off to the side from the explosion yeah. from Shan's little explosive device. Um, so, yeah, I love you, Toto 360. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I love that all top bounty hunters still have flamethrowers, no matter what. Oh, yeah. It's just like a staple of their arsenal. It's like, you know what? Flamethrower. Yeah. That, that's what I mean. Total like Swiss Army knife. Yeah. I'm kind of expecting this sort of hatch to open from their back and like a battery of missiles to suddenly start Absolutely. flying out in all directions. Well, I'm pretty sure uh, our uh, famous Boba Fett had one. Uh, um, we he dish, we did, yeah, yeah. yeah, and we saw that at the end in Mandalorian yeah. season two. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that's, that's one of the things that did come out of Mandalorian that I know we didn't cover it on the podcast, but one of the things that did come out of Mandalorian was very much you go through levels like you do in a video game when you're, when you're getting, uh, your, your stasis, status as a bounty hunter, you are a- allowed to get a jetpack, for example, when you get to a certain level and you're allowed to get certain weapons when you get to a certain level. So it feels like the reason why Cad Bane is the Swiss Army knife is because he's old school. He has 
all of these years of experience and all these ways of working and all these little elements added to a suit. Like he does have, as you said, the jet boots when he gets kicked off the side of the building, which I thought was the end of Cad Bane. I absolutely thought this was the moment when they were kicking him off the side of the building uh, on the planet when Fennec uh, kicked him over. It was like, how is he getting out of that one? Oh, of course, jet boots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that, so. that, that's, and that's the best Star, most Star Warsy thing. I was just like, because I thought the exact same. I was like, oh, so this is how Fennec Shan becomes the top bounty hunter for a while, yeah. and she just kills it off. Like it is like Highlander. <laughs> there can be only one. Yeah. And then like I was that. like, oh no, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Whole yeah. galaxy full of uh, scum and villainy, of course. Well, no, whole galaxy full of jet boots. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, anything else about the fight, um, guys, that you want to talk about before we move on to the next point? No, no? I want to talk about the next point because I loved it. Okay, on to blaster point number two then. Um, I just call this Omega Saves Herself because really we do have the Bad Batch unable to get to her at all. They do have, they do have a radio, a piece of radio contact with her so they know that she's still alive and they're aiming for her, but they never get to her to save her until that final moment. And she does, I think she does such a great job fending for herself um in this episode yeah. kind of we've been kind Absolutely. of seeing her as being in being in the charge of the bad batch and they've been teaching her little trick tips and tricks as they as they go along but we haven't seen her being able to take care of herself to the extent that she does in this episode and i think they did a they've done a really good job of making her um self-sufficient you know there's the initial element where she uh where she tricks toto into letting her out of the cell um I love that she still fixes him. She doesn't just knock him over the head when he opens up, uh, like every other uh, person who gets released from a cell. She fixes him and then just knocks him out for a short time. Now, if she hadn't done that, she might not have had as many problems as she does getting away later on. But she's still honest, and just it's still a a good character trait to do that. But um, but I like that that's where it starts. That she's kind of having this um kind of uh, conversation with the droid, saying to him, "Are you sure?" this is the right master for you because he's not treating you very well. So there's, a, there's that conversation again about the, the droid revolution. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that, I, th- I think that was the interesting thing because you're absolutely right. I loved, um, I loved uh, Omega here on her own fighting for herself, being resourceful, being resilient, mm-hmm. adaptable, all that. But at the same time as well, she, you know, she did employ a little bit of um, sort of, you know, mind warfare by, you know, trying to sow those seeds of doubt into th- Toto 360 and I really like that as well I like that she was you know just sowing those seeds of doubt to see whether you know a bit of a rift could be be formed in some ways is he the right master you know he seems to treat you pretty well he's not got time for you all this you know it kind of reminded me uh, like of my dad on the golf course with me where he's trying to put me off a putt and <laughs> constantly like oh if you check that angle or this angle what about this break here and blah 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 and you're just like you just stop and uh, maybe that's ultimately what Toto did because it doesn't seem to have an effect but you never know come the droid revolution mm-hmm. um, then then Toto could be the one to take down the mighty Cad Bane you never know you never know I doubt it like <laughs> um, because in fairness Toto was pretty uh, you know it, it looked it looked like he was over for a few times I was wondering what Cad Bane was going to do to him when mm-hmm. um, Omega had uh, escaped from their ship and so, yeah, he was kind of pretty much in the wars, really. But he was. I think Omega, that was, that was a really good episode for, and, and, and the last one as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think uh, we mentioned just that you, you're seeing her character, yeah. um, more. It, it is giving her agency and, and all of that. And yeah. it was really, really good. Um, and I, I did, I just enjoyed this aspect of, of her in this episode as mm-hmm. well. Completely agree. Like, this was the, the one where uh, Omega starts to become her own character versus the learning. Yeah. Like, we've seen, we've seen her be taught a lot. And yeah. she's always been the innocent that has, when we first met Fanny Chant, it was all because she trusted someone and then she couldn't get herself out of the scrape. This is her essentially pretty much right until the end getting herself out of the scrape. Yeah. She was able to figure out how to, um, essentially kind of c- contact the bad bad. She was able to get the communicator work. Like, she did it all. Like, it was yeah. all based on her knowledge. Well, the knowledge she has lear- learned. Well, that's what I was going to say, actually. One of the nice touches here, they didn't do the tropey thing of her 
getting her bow and arrow back and shooting exactly the way she was taught to do it four episodes ago or putting together all the advice that she's been given specifically from each member of the batch. She's just using her own brain to get herself out of the yeah. situation. And I love this. Is, this is what I was uh, one of the moments I really enjoyed was when Shand is there telling her, I'm here to help you. Your friends aren't coming. Don't worry. I won't hurt you. And she still realizes what happened last time that she trusted yeah. Fennec Shand and drops the, uh, drops the <laughs> massive clone alien on top of her. <laughs> um, and, and knocks her out effectively and gets out of there to make sure that she is giving it her own agency and isn't, re- isn't relying on anybody else in this situation. Cause she's not going to trust Fennec Shand because of what happened last time. So yeah. I thought that was really smart to, to have her do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I must say, I, when you were saying, I, they, you know, she didn't get her, her bow. Um, back, um, I just immediately thought, no, absolutely, because she she basically dumped a a cloning vessel <laughs> uh, on onto yeah. Fennec Shan with um with all the green goo and basically the dead clone in there. Um, yeah. So I, I thought, was trying, I, not only on screen for a couple of seconds, but I was trying to work out what that clone is of because it's not one of the clone army. And it's not a Kaminoan because the Kaminoans have the really long necks and the really small heads. I, yeah. It's not, it, it doesn't, it seems like a mix of the two. So I was wondering whether it was just the artwork or it, it just felt different from a Kaminoan. Um, and it's massive. It's about three times the size of, uh, of Fennec Shand, uh, as it drops on the floor on top of her. Unless Fennec Shand is a lot shorter than I think she is. I, I was like Chris. I thought it was a Kaminoan as well. And then. I, I guess it, yeah, it didn't have the same physiology mm. uh, in that sense. Um, it didn't have that long neck. And then when I kind of look back at it, I feel as though it's the classic alien that would visit Earth in yeah. X Files. <laughs> um, and I just wondered if that was that that was the kind of little Easter egg here. That, you this know. is why I love you guys. Mm-hmm. Myself and John literally at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Because I watch I watch it and I went, okay, it's not it doesn't it looks like a Camille, but it doesn't. Hmm. They, are they they're cloning themselves now. Okay, cool. Oh wait, that starts to look like the, they're starting to make this look a bit more muscular and bigger. Oh mm-hmm. my god, that's like the greys that come to Earth. And then I went straight to, oh my god, that's the Asgardians in Stargate. Oh my god, <laughs> Star Wars <laughs> Stargate. Oh, yeah. literally, I just, I love, I love it. Like I suppose the planet itself is is the abandoned um, cloning site of yes. the of the Kaminoans. So it's entirely possible in story that they've effectively tried to create an army of Kaminoans who are very different from the uh, from the scientist Kaminoans yes. that we've seen so far. The so army it, version. Yeah, it's it's entirely possible that's what it was. I just thought it was interesting because it looked so massive <laughs> uh, there in the scene. Um, anything else about about Omega saving herself in in the episode, Chris? I just want to call out the scene with Toto and Omega. I know we talked about it, but I I was hoping that she would take Toto with her. So because the the initial interaction where she's like, yeah. "He's so bad for you," and Seth Green, I I forever since Buffy. Have loved Seth Green uh, and like his stupid buddy. It used to be stupid monkey, but I think it's stupid buddy productions now with uh, uh, Brackenmire, hey, the robot chicken stuff, and the Modoc. Um, that for me, like, is fantastic. And hearing Seth Green, Seth Green has a very distinct style, and yes, yeah, I love him. So I was like, oh my god, is she like you said the droid, the droid revolution? Oh my god, is she gonna like? Get him with it, and is that going to be the new talking <laughs> droid that's going to be with the Bad Batch? Oh my god, that's going to be like my brain just ran forward. I was like, "This is going to be fantastic!" Oh, no, oh. no, no, he is the sidekick of Cad Bane, and uh, I don't think I would uh, like to be on uh, on the wanted list for Cad Bane if he ran away. <laughs> he'll he'll never leave them alone. Um, but yeah, no, really good to hear him here, and I, I think I could hear him a lot more. This week, I know we only got a couple of lines from um, from Seth Green in last week's episode, same as Cad Bane, but I could really hear his voice uh, in this week's episode. Um, yeah. Agreed. Uh, and it was very Seth Green. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was like, oh, they let him be himself. Cool. Well, I guess with those two big points uh, done, let's go on to our final blaster point because we do get the reveal of uh, Omega's importance uh, in this episode. We get, we get the actual reveal of why it is that she's so important, which I thought was pretty massive. We've been waiting for this uh, all season now as to why she's important. 
doesn't have any kind of force powers. Um, it's been confirmed now. We kind of yeah. had disregarded that about episode three. Um, but we were she's still not Palpatine's she's not Palpatine's offspring friend. either. There was an, we were kind of thinking that at one stage as well. But we did get it right. Like we did at one point. I remember us saying maybe it could have been off air. <laughs> but <laughs> listeners, just as we did get it right, because we did go at one point. <laughs> oh my god, she's just a fem- She's a female clone of Django. Uh, yeah. but there's I, more I think, to it than that. Yeah, I think we missed the kind of central thing, yes. certainly, that there's only two people in the galaxy that are pure clones directly taken from Django and have the full genetic material of the original clone. Um, so it's something that that we may have missed in this, uh, in just the Bad Batch alone, but I know by the end of the Clone Wars, they were kind of saying the clones had been, so many clones had been created throughout the Clone Wars, the actual Clone Wars, not just the TV series, uh, but the actual Clone Wars, so many clones had been created from just this one specimen that they were starting to degrade and not get as good. This is part of the reason why they were easier to beat. I think by the end of, of the seven seasons of the Clone Wars and the end of the Clone Wars, they were getting easier to beat because they were, they weren't as good as the first generation clones, like, uh, Rex, uh, who yeah, we just met a, copy of a, a couple copy of weeks of a copy ago. Of a copy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. she is the most important one for them, and Boba Fett would be as important for the Kaminoans because both of them have the full genetic material, which means they can start again with their cloning process with some real genetic material that's yeah. as close to the original as possible. So, um, so this is it's quite a big reveal, and you can Definitely. see why it's, why she's so important to the Kaminoans. Yeah, and I I think the really good thing here is that it 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 goes back to our blaster point too as well. You know in this moment were, you know, you, you see her frightened as well because, yes, she's resourceful and so on, but the emotional side of what she's just gone through, you know, it, it is shown here when she's been rescued by the Bad Batch and the, the, that kind of safety net of these four uh, clone troopers that are part of her family. And then the the emotional side of her learning about who she actually is and how she fits into the the galaxy in a sense that you know yet she's valuable yet um dispensable because you you know you see the i, I guess it links to that, that more ruthless side of the kim and owens that really just see her as um a commodity that they need to trade in. Um, and that is the material of her genes and, and the genetic code. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you hear, um, you hear Lama Su say, retrieve the, the material and then terminate her. Yeah. Um, so very, very cold and, and so on. And, and it, to some extent, you, you have that. Um, I, I think it, it really, that end bit kind of just, that whole more emotional self-aware aspect of her place in this world. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really good. Um, and, and also how the Bad Batch um, are not trying to keep it from her. It's, we've got to tell her um, yeah. that she's um, she is valuable, uh, but people will come for her for that. Well, to be clear... Is an attack that goes, Hunter, you have to tell her. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to tell her this. Yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter, you have to share this information that I found out. Tech finds the, the data, finds out that she's an alpha. Um, Echo says, we have to tell her and then leaves it to Hunter to yeah. do. So yeah, yeah Hunter You're kind basically of gets her real dad. We're all just our uncles. <laughs> You've got to break the big news here to Omega that she's going to be chased for the rest of her life uh, for what's inside her, effectively. Um, I, I did like the reveal, and you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on as well about Nala Say. I, I kind of like that moment of reveal there is somebody that was protecting her and there is a relationship there. Um, we, it, it's interesting looking back at the start of the season now to see that uh, Omega, right at the start, was working alongside Nalase. Uh, Nalase was introducing her as kind of the assistant in her in her labs, basically. So they had developed some kind of friendship there. Yeah. Whereas I think if the Prime Minister Lamassu had gotten his um, his way, she would just have been sitting there in a tank waiting to be waiting for her genetic material to be used effectively. So, um, so uh, uh, looking back on. The relationship at the beginning it's interesting that that now it's coming up that there is a protective side uh to some of the kaminoans to uh to omega as well yeah i i think we've learned more about the kaminoans and mm. and the the uh in in these last two episodes and this series i guess than at least from the the uh, prequels mm-hmm. um not and sure. they're not just simply 
the, the this race that sort of moves like the Martians in Mars Attacks, mm-hmm. you know. Going. <laughs> so I think um, I think it's been really good for that. You know, it's really added a little bit of. I mean, just not loads. It's just kind of it just gives that added spice to it, doesn't it? Really. So I think um, th- this was yeah really good. The reveal of uh, Amiga's importance here yeah. for yeah. sure. Uh, anything else on the episode that we haven't talked about, guys? No. I just have a, a more practical question. What does this mean? So, essentially, she has the genetic material. She has it within her to become as good of a bounty hunter. With the, uh, she, she can be as good as Django Fed, Boba Fett. So, essentially, she has the genetic skills. The reason Django Fett was chosen was that he was like top prime he was prime genetic material for an art for for a soldier yeah essentially like yeah, so much. essentially she can could be as good as hunter as good as uh like Django and boba and the, like theoretically is or is it just kind of like yeah i was i just trying to understand like is it yeah she could she could absolutely be as good a bounty hunter as Boba yeah. Fett. I think the genetic yeah. traits that they've bred or yeah. or cl- bred cloned <laughs> uh the the those genetic traits that would pass between okay. the generations and, and and is captured within the the sequencing of the DNA. And I suppose we know because we know how good a, a bounty hunter Boba Fett is that's it's it would be passed the same way, yeah. so she should be as good uh, at, at being a bounty hunter as, as uh, Boba Fett. But remember, every one of the clones, including the Bad Batch, has had some changes made to them by the Kaminoans when they're doing their cloning process. So it's not that she could be as good as Hunter, it's that she's as good as Django and as good as Boba Fett. Oh, yes. So Sorry, the rest of them have pure. all, have all had uh, amendments or changes made to them during the cloning process. So some of them, like the Bad Batch themselves, have had genetic mutations that have made them really good at certain areas like we we know from this team but every one of them is different from Django Fett except for Boba Fett and now we know Omega okay yeah cool so that, that, thank you because that that does make it very much more interesting because yeah we could have a Boba Fett no that's that's terrible <laughs> that's terrible yeah yes. that is terrible can't do what's it Barbara what's it? Barbara Fett <laughs> Barbara Fett there you go <laughs> there Odessa you go. Fett because they did even call out in the episode when they mentioned Boba Fett that he won- he was once called Alpha and she's Omega. So yeah. um so they are calling out that there is that there is a possible change of name for the character coming in the future uh, that, yeah. from Omega to to something else and maybe she will choose Barbara Fett. Uh, I kind of like that. Well the thing I'm really <laughs> interested in and I'm sorry, just calling it out now and we can move into the notes is the next Mandalorian live action mm-hmm. is the book of Boba Fett. Absolutely. Uh, and the, it could be, I'm going to find my sister. That would be cool. There you go. Anyway. There, you go. there will be some ties in there. And remember, Fennec Shand is matter. Yeah. Fennec Shand is in uh, the book of Boba Fett as yep. well. So exactly. That's a, that's a good note and a good point to end the discussion about the episode. Any Anything else that you guys want to talk about before we uh, close out? No, Nothing not from me. Side. Excellent. Excellent. Well, overall then, uh, what did you think of the episode? John, I'll give it to you straight away. Uh, what did you think of Bad Batch Episode 9, Bounty Lost? Um, I loved it. Uh, again, this is another five out of five for me. Ooh, it's yeah. five Toto thruster legs <laughs> out of five. Um, yeah, I, I just loved how, again, the, the, the development of Omega in here without the Bad Batch uh, and having two uh, fantastic bounty hunters having a little face off and how that kind of translates to the Kiminoans. Mm-hmm. Um, really liked it. And with Toto spinning around, um, a la Kylie Minogue, then um, I guess, you know, that j- just brought that nice light relief. But I just thought it really developed uh, Amiga uh, as, as the, you know, the central point that the Bad Batch are around. And, yep. and then the, 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 the rescuing her from the escape pod uh, and that, that family vibe I thought was really, really yeah. good. So, uh, yeah, this was a, a five Toto Thruster legs out of five for me. Excellent, excellent. How about you, Chris? What do you think overall? Uh, I, I'm, I was in. This was the, uh, the, the hooks and barbs are finally fully set. 
Um, this was what I. This is the 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 action I'm here for. This is the storytelling. This is the the choices I'm I'm very much down for. I, I do understand that we may have to go back to one or two story of the weeks, uh, but that's fine because every now and again we'll get this just spectacular um, choice uh, and episode. So yeah, I'm down 100. percent What about yourself, Derek? Excellent. Um, I, I love the setting of this episode. I think I, I'm, I'm totally aligned with you guys. I love I love the episode overall, but I love the setting. Like you mentioned that the the smoke that's coming out of the doors as those places are open, and uh, how they use that to to hide the characters is really cinematic. Yes. I really like that for for a 22 minute uh, cartoon that's effectively aimed at kids. You know, um, I, I, I they've done such a great job of making it stand outside of those kind of parameters, like. Genuinely, I'm now excited every week on a Friday morning when I get up in the morning, I sit down with my cereal and my coffee to watch a cartoon at 8 a.m. in the morning before I go to work. It's the greatest start to it's a like Friday Saturday morning. It's like Saturdays as a kid. Exactly. Exactly. It's recapturing that for me. So I'm really enjoying this series and really enjoying having this uh, to watch every week for 16 weeks. That's so cool. Well, I, I suppose, sorry, 14 weeks because we had three of them in the first episode, didn't we? So, uh, yes. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have, uh, Another eight more to go, don't we? Yeah. Seven more to go. Something like that. My maths is terrible on a Friday evening, but all I will say is I really enjoyed the episode. Uh, let's go on to some of the feedback from our fellow troopers. Um, first up, over an email to feedback at TV Podcast Industries, Caleb Dyer says, I've been listening to the Bad Bad podcast, and I want to bring up a point related to Caleb Doom. Uh, you guys keep keep saying he might return, but in Rebels, he is extremely distrustful of all clones, including Captain Rex. So I don't think he would return, because if we met the Bad Batch again, he wouldn't be so distrustful of clones in Rebels in the future. Uh, also, have you noticed how bad the Bad Batch are in one versus one situations? Is this realistic? They're such so good as a team, but individually, they're quite poor fighters. Thanks so much, Caleb. Yeah, thanks so much, Caleb. Um, uh, I, th- I think um, I think you're right. You know, uh, in-, in Rebels, he is extremely distrustful of mm-hmm. clones, and you're right, including Rex. And 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 it's I guess it's just more to have him back in in the series that. He, that's what I would love to see. And so it's kind of saying that, you know, he might ultimately return. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, with the clones, the way it went down, um, the during Order 66, as we see in the first um, episode, it, it's just the sense that they didn't immediately go to, to kill him effectively yeah. and, and do the Order 66. He was still really mindful about, trusting them anyway Sorry. you know he jumped across the ravine at the start but i just wonder if if there are any clones that he might have some thread of trust it could be with the bad batch clones um and maybe but yeah. it's more about wanting to see caleb uh doom in this series exactly. or at least make a, a reappearance but I'm not, I'm not too sure you know as we move along now i guess i'm not too sure that that would happen other yeah. than if it's where the nascent sort of rebellion it, it is and he's with um uh, some of the other main players that like uh Sol Guerrero yeah. so I it, it, I guess it's more just uh, a hope that he's there yeah. and I think um I think I think what we were saying really is that they've created the character he's in the first episode it's a great little nod for Rebels fans you know I think they can write their way around this that he could have another meeting with the Bad Batch, they may meet up with them again, but it it may reinforce why he distrusts clones, yeah. whatever his meeting is. You know, there's, there, there are ways to include him. I know you're absolutely right. When it gets to Rebels, he is massively distrustful of clones. Understandable. About a million of them turn their guns on the people that were supposed to be the protectors of the universe. So I, I can get that, including himself. So I, I can get why he would be uh, very distrustful of them. But he may have another encounter with the clones or maybe with Omega at some point in the future, just because... The characters in the universe, and that's yeah. what they tend to do in in Star Wars. But I don't think he'd become a major player in this show by any means. His story is is in Rebels, really. Yeah, I like like I, I think it's because it is his his story has played out. I I think there can be we've we've got uh, what eight more episodes of this, seven more episodes of this season. Yeah, plus an additional who knows how many series and seven more, the, seven more series <laughs> and a, six more in a movie. Um, yeah, I, I, I never say never. I think that's exactly. a, the key thing because what what we're even finding now is they will always find nice ways of weaving the, the a galaxy that is far, far away 
very closely threaded. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. look at it. Look what happened based on a whole family Skywalker saga. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He's a he's a piece on the chessboard. I yes. Think. And I think on on the the one what the one uh, against one situations, the one on one situations. You know, I, I, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I think in some cases this the one on one situation is there's a lot of others attacking at the time, so they're outnumbered. I think in other times as well, they work so good as a team. Um, because they all have these individual components and they've almost been created by the Kaminoans to have the, those, con- those links, those synergies to, to work as, uh, dare I say, an effective team. Right. And, um, that, I mean, ultimately you put tech in there and he's got to think on a tech side of things. Yeah. Hunter is the tracker and he's got the knife. You know, the main one, is probably Wrecker because he's able to sort of go through them like a hot knife through butter. But I think um, what Caleb's really talking about is, I remember we're talking uh, Hunter versus um, Cad Bane, and Cad Bane won. He's the best at what he does. He's, as I said, he's the, the best bounty hunter out there. So that's showing, that's more showing how good Cad Bane is um, than how than, than that Hunter's a bad fighter. It's that Cad Bane is an amazing person who's ready to take him out and took him by surprise. And then we also had Wrecker versus Fennec Shand, and Wrecker lost out to her in a split second as well so um so i I understand what you what you mean Caleb. but partly that's to do with the situations where they've been alone without their brothers without the bad batch around them and being one-on-one with somebody has been somebody that is quite powerful as well it's not just them versus another clone and they and they lose i wonder if it's something in the um pure genetic code i mean boba uh when he was introduced in Return of the Jedi and Empire, I mean, effectively died from a faulty jetpack. Um, you know, not, uh, <laughs> well, so he died pretty Salak quickly. Fish. Not dead, as we know now, John. Well, that is true. Oh, that now. is true. I keep forgetting that, actually. <laughs> I keep forgetting that. <laughs> Thanks yes. so much for your feedback, Caleb. Uh, also over an email, we have Victor Von Doom, who says, Greetings, Derek, John, and Chris, and fellow troopers. This is one of my favorite episodes of The Bad Batch so far. I loved the Battle of the Bounty Hunters. Bane, Fennec, and Boba are making me a bounty hunter fan. Of of course, I tend to admire the colourful bad guys, hence my nickname of Von Doom. Uh, this dissension amongst the Kaminoans is getting pretty messy. Will the Bad Batch add a Kaminoan to their ranks in the future? Oh, I like that. Mm. Amiga's connection to the Batch is now even stronger with Hunter the father figure, Wrecker the crazy brother, and the rest, uh, weird uncles. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to chat with you other defenders next week. Love your podcast and the trooper feedback. Cheers, Victor Von Doom. Thanks for the email, Victor. Um, I'm really uh, liking the the theory around Nala Say potentially coming on board. You know, um, with with the Bad Batch, um, mm-hmm. could be really good. Uh, definitely, um, yes. The 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 connection here to Omega is really strong, and I think you know you see that at the end as well. I think mm. that, and actually, all the way through this episode, Hunter's expression I thought was captured really well in terms of his, um, I guess his concern, his worry yeah. uh, for the safety of Omega. I thought it was really well captured, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, he was very pensive all the way through here. Uh, so yeah, it's um. Definitely also, I think, one of my favourite episodes so far. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Victor. Like, I, I do wonder if Lamassu, if that, that, that kind of relationship with Nalase and Lamassu, like, he already suspected that there was something going on there. So I wonder if if that will play out in a bigger way in, with, with Nalase. Will he now realise that she's the one that hired Fennec Shand? Will he, will he make some connection there and take her out, effectively? Yeah. That she's, um, th- that he, he does seem to, um, have a major suspicion about her already, and if it's another failed plan, uh, will his suspicions grow, and, and will he uh, will he take it out on her? You know, he was willing to kill the Meg after taking out the the um, genetic material from her that they need. Is he willing to now kill Nalase to get his hands on on Omega? Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Exactly. Uh, thank you for the feedback, Victor. And um, yeah, we all have those weird uncles. <laughs> I am one of those weird uncles. No. You are one of those weird uncles. <laughs> uh, over on Facebook, we have some uh, feedback from Dan Lee who says, I enjoyed this episode immensely. This series seems to be going strength to strength. It was great to see Omega using her head. And also, for probably the first time, I really believe the bond between her and the Batch now. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks, Dan. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I suppose it's more that the the end where it's the kind of like the as I say as Victor just talked about, it's that kind of crazy uncle, uh, weird sorry weird uncle, crazy brother and uh, father figure. Like mm-hmm. you can start to see the more emotional, and as John said, you can see the emotion on Hunter's face more. So I suppose it's just it it's taken time, but it's now coming out through a lot stronger. Yeah, and and as we mentioned on the podcast, I could certainly see even more of Amiga's place in the batch now because she's able to do all the stuff on her own yes because she didn't need them to come and pick her up and save her and her cry in the corner she's as active now in this episode as all the rest of them have been all season and they've just been protecting her a lot whereas this episode feels like she was really active and really able to be a member of the batch now so agreed yeah definitely um thanks uh thanks dan uh, for the feedback. Uh, also on Facebook, Robert Phillips said, Some great bits in this. I wasn't expecting a bounty hunter face-off. All the way Amiga more or less rescued herself. And while political infighting is what I remember for Star Wars is 4, 5, and 6, I mean episodes 1, 2, 3, <laughs> I didn't think it would creep into cartoons. Plus, the planets look like the map paintings that would be in a film. And I've just twigged. The robot is actually to do, like the lists. <laughs> ah, good one. To do yeah. list 360. There to you go. do 360. <laughs> there you go. I, I was thinking like Toto. Like Toto yeah, I was. Of Oz. It is oh, the... no, no. I, I, I'm right there with Bob. Like it was a to do list. Like it was, it was a full circle to do list. See, there you go. You yeah. and Bob clearly work harder than I do. I just had uh, Wizard of Oz in my brain. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of to-dos, but um, I think I've obviously got... Um, Blinkers on your to-dos. Uh, no, I've got, I've got <laughs> Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz of going, going around. Uh, um, we so. are, after all, friends of Dorothy. Of course we are. Of course we are. Uh, thanks so much, Bob, for that. Yeah, uh, the political infighting, yeah, certainly an, an attribute of episode one, uh, the, the first prequel of Star Wars. I think we always rem- all remember that moment of the Trade Federation discussions rolling past us on the screen going, <laughs> get the lightsabers out and somebody shoot somebody, please. Um, but it's, it's been a pretty central feature of, of the Clone Wars cartoon. There were, it's always about the politics of what's going on on either side. You know, remember this is a war that was fought between a droid army and a clone army. And then at the end, they basically went, turn off the droid army and make the clone army fight the people they've been fighting with the whole time. <laughs> and it all just ended. And then a new, uh, a new uh, political system came up in the galaxy. So it, it definitely has spawned out of uh, the political side of, of it. But uh, no offense to George Lucas. I think it's certainly done a lot better now these days in these stories than it was in the initial opening of, of The Phantom Menace. There is no offense taken. It is the thing. This has been a Thanks, uni- George. <laughs> there is no offense taken. Like, this is the thing. The Star Wars. It has been, if anything, it was one man's dream, which has now kind of just been added to and expanded upon <laughs> by the creative vision of so many more mm-hmm. in fun, unique, and amazing ways. Uh, I will yeah. let you also say there is probably some bad takes choices and things like that but overall it's been amazing and yeah. in this case in Filoni we trust yes we do yes we do and uh, in Jennifer as well um, thanks so much for everybody that sent in the feedback for this week's episode of Bad Batch hopefully you can send us in some more feedback for the next episode email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries or you can find us on Instagram or over on Twitter if you want to send us any thoughts over there as well uh, it's been great hearing from me for this episode and great watching this episode yes yeah We'll see you again next week. And in Jennifer, we trust. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. We are going to be back to chat about Star Wars The Bad Batch, Episode 10, Common Ground, uh, which will be on Disney Plus next Friday. And, of course, then we are midweek here with uh, our coverage and discussions of Loki. Episode four. Episode four. Yes. Indeed. Over the halfway point on, on Loki. Uh, I want to say thank you to Rebel, Rebel Cells, a podcast covering uh, Star Wars, because they pointed out that the episode names uh, for Star Wars The Bad Batch have finally been released. The next three or four episodes uh, have been have been released. Uh, thanks, guys, over Rebel, Rebel Cells. I wouldn't have gotten the episode titles otherwise, so uh, I've been waiting every week for the episodes to air to write them down really quickly in our <laughs> notes. So, uh, so that's great. Thanks so much for that. Uh, and once again, thank you to all of you for joining us for this episode. Yes. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fellow defenders. We will speak to you next week. Yes. Again, thanks so much, fellow troopers. It's great having 
these chit chats with you about the Bad Batch. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep trooping. Super Trooper, no, no. life is gonna do, do, do. I don't remember the words. <laughs> Super pa, Trooper. Pa. <laughs> Chris is like, Abba? Abba's a bit before my time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.